Okay, now we're going to go into Module 6. We're going to discuss payer systems. Uh, we're going to try and understand some of the technologies that payers use, how they use them, and how they integrate with other systems. So, in a, a healthcare payer basically has four primary sets of systems. They'll have systems that will deal with the subscribers. Uh, those are the people that are covered by the insurance company and are reimbursed or provided with the health-related services. They'll also have systems for providers that will enable them to engage directly so that they can examine what claims have been paid or determine what eligibility benefits are available for uh, patients that come in. The sales and support systems are basically used to manage uh, the sales. These are like brokers and groups for uh, employee eligibility where an employer will basically uh, add to their roster list or uh, brokers who go out and create sales will determine what the pricing is for a particular policy. And then management and control systems are responsible for the basic operation of the company, uh, including reports uh, and adjudication of claims, uh, regulatory items, uh, and financial reporting. So this is a, an example of a business architecture diagram. Uh, basically, we have the insurance company in the middle. Uh, on the left to right axis, you will find that that is more of an operational type of uh, flow and the north-south or vertical axis is more of a ancillary or supporting types of functions. Uh, in the middle would be the core processing or adjudication which is the main function of an insurance company. So subscribers might have a set of systems that will allow them to look at explanation of benefits or even provide coordination of care, disease management. They might also uh, have some information uh, about their personal health record. On the right side, the providers are vendors, providers, even financial institutions for electronic funds transfer. Providers may look at claims or may try and get on the network. And vendors who will provide durable medical equipment will be similar to providers in that sense. On the vertical axis, again, we have at the sales and group management, things that are related to managing roster roles or acquiring new members and subscribers, as well as some government agencies in terms of uh, reporting. The management and control functions deal with regulators, management, and then actuarial. The actuarial group is a very heavy data-centric organization uh, that will take data from claims as well as external data to underwrite claims. So subscriber systems will include things like location of participating providers, benefits listing, disease care management, explanation of benefits which occur when a claim is denied or paid. There's a full explanation of benefits. Sometimes those are electronic, uh, other times they are on paper. Changes in plans and other notifications and facilitate self-service answer to general questions. Many of these systems are web-based. In fact, you'll see some of the payers provide a, an app for iPhones or Droids. Uh, and what this does is this the entire focus of this is obviously to promote better health for the payers, but uh, for the patients by the payers, but also reduce operational costs through the use of self-service tools. Provider systems really allow for the submission of claims electronically or review status of claims and claim payment. They'll also allow for expedient approval process for procedures. So if a patient walks in and we need to get authorization, we're able to use a portal that will allow us to determine whether or not that patient is eligible to receive those services. Uh, these systems are also used for notifications between the payers and providers, and in some cases the, these are all done via EDI. So for example, before we talked about 277, 278 eligibility, uh, those are uh, types of electronic uh, interchange, uh, electronic EDI, electronic data interchange documents that allow uh, the messages to go back and forth, and this would be system-to-system -system integration. Uh, web sites are also used to facilitate answers to general questions, uh, maybe about payment schedules or about certain payment benefits. So these were designed to increase engagement with providers and promote the expeditious operations of claims management. Also, we try and reduce costs by ensuring that all of the items are readily available for providers. In sales and group management, uh, these are very similar to retail or financial environments, so they are act like sales systems, and you'll have contact management systems if you've heard of salesforce.com. Uh, there's a lot of functions that are basically like that here. Uh, they primarily handle uh, leads, lead generation, as well as uh, handling certain items for large groups, employee benefits, notifications between payers, groups, and brokers, and again, facilitate answers to general questions. Many of these systems do have a mobile aspect to them. Uh, they are generally web-based, uh, and um, they, um, uh, they will basically figure out uh, what types of information need to go between sales and groups. 
on the management and control section. What we're focused here is core operation for claims adjudication, that is, payment or denial of claims. There is a heavy use of data warehousing and analytics as all of these systems are collecting data based on the payers and subscribers, uh, I'm sorry, based on subscribers and providers. Uh, there will be a significant amount of reporting systems that will produce reports for explanation of benefits, as well as reports to the Department of Insurance or other reports. And then we have statistical systems such as SAS or SPSS uh, that are used for actuarial underwriting. So these are very complex uh, algorithms that will determine whether or not policies should be given and if so, at what price. Adjudication systems are the core processing system for the payer. Generally, they are giant rules-based engines. Uh, they will examine the claim against the benefit structure of the subscriber's policy and determine the final status. Uh, in some cases, less than 20%, depending on the payer, claims cannot be easily determined whether or not a payment or denial should be made. That number is generally lower than 20%. It's probably around 10% 10, 10 or 15%, depending on the uh, payer, of course. Those claims were sent to an operator for review and examination. And then even if it's denied, there's an appeals and uh, grievances and appeals process that will occur where the claim is reviewed, and then they may make the adjustment inside of the claims adjudication systems. Many of these systems are older, and they are uh, COBOL-based or uh, you know some older type of system. Uh, some of the newer ones are out there uh, from Perot and McKesson and Trizetto are trying to displace the older systems. There are a few, what we would say, horror stories of uh, replacements. Uh, they are available on the web. I don't want to mention them here on YouTube, but you can find them. Uh, where replacing these systems isn't as easy as one would think. And the rules are really based on each state. They're not, there's no general set of rules. You couldn't buy a, an adjudication system and say it will work in New York and it will work the same way in California. That is not the case. These are very complicated rule sets uh, that are based on the government regulations as well as how the business itself has uh, made its name or made its money. One of the things that we want to do as a pair is we want to integrate using service-oriented architecture. Services are a method of integrating systems, so it's not necessarily a program or a system. It's the way in which systems will integrate, normally using something like XML or, and a web-based protocol. So in other words, one system may make a request using an internet request, almost like a browser, and basically send it a request for information. And then the corresponding system, which has a service, uh, it takes that uh, XML request and responds back with the data or something else, whatever this particular service is, as an XML format as well. And what this does is this provides a common way to speak among systems. We're using a common format using XML and a common set of structures. This will also give us clear and concise results and ensure backward compatibility where necessary. Because of the way XML is structured, it makes it easier. Uh, in an EDI setting, we might send a claim to a payer in an 837 format, and using a service, we can embed that 837 claim within a service, and then it can handle the claim, and then it could send an acknowledgement back if it was necessary. What we might use is a messaging architecture that will allow us to create a guaranteed transfer of messages from system to system. So what might happen is, is that we might have a claim that comes, let's say, in from one system via the web, and it will go into the messaging structure. What will then happen is, is that the bus, as we call it, or message bus, will take that message and send it to the appropriate systems using a publish subscribe type of uh, arrangement, where we create a queue or a series, like a, like a bucket, think of it as. And what will happen is, is that the message goes into the bucket. And then system A is subscribed to that bucket. So any messages that are there, it will come in and pick it up. Uh, if the system is down, those messages will stay in the bucket until system A comes back up. And then when system A says, oh, okay, you have more messages in here, it takes all those messages. The key behind the messaging architecture is that it is guaranteed delivery, that it will guarantee that the messages will get to their final destination because it waits until they are picked up and it stores those messages. So it's basically a, a, an easy way of storing information uh, and what will, uh, storing these messages so that they will get picked up at a later time and you're not waiting around for transactions. One of the key things about this is that it is what's called asynchronous. So the system on the left side can put something onto the queue, continue its processing, 
without having to wait for an acknowledgement back from the other system. It will just stay there. If it was synchronous, what that means is that this system over here would send the message directly to system B, and it would have to wait until system B responded to it. If that response never comes in because this message is down, this system could not no longer process anything else. So this messaging layer gives us an easy way of distributing transactions in an asynchronous manner, thereby improving performance of both systems. One of the things that's important for payers is this whole notion of an information architecture. One of the courses that you'll take is on information uh, data warehousing and data analytics. The way this works is we have our core set of systems, our source data. And one of the things that we wish to do is take all that data and bring it into an ODS or an operational data store. The way this data is brought in from these is usually through an ETL tool or an extract, transform, and load. So it will pull data, say, nightly or every half day, populate it into the ODS in some raw format, so that this way we have all the core data in one place. Then there's transformation processes that will occur again between this ODS and RDW, or reporting data warehouse. This will contain a data set that is optimized for reporting. In the database class, you'll probably learn the differences between data that is transactional in nature versus data that will be reporting in nature. One is called Online Transaction Processing, OLTP. The other is called OLAP, or Online Analytical Processing. From this RDW, we will create operational cubes or send the data to analytical engine uh, like uh, SAS or SPSS or something else. So we will create a business intelligence center of excellence where tools like MedStat, which is a clinical support and analytics system, or SAS or something else, will take the data and run some programs and analytics on it. In creating a business intelligence center of excellence, what we'll basically do is we'll create these series of dashboards that will pull the data and transform the data and ensure that we have all of the information in easily viewable manner so that we can empower clients to modify their business views and extend insights into this whole notion of single version of the truth in a clear and concise manner.